Welcome everybody to the Beginning the Research Process Workshop. My name is Amanda Bizet and I am one of the reference librarians here at the NCU Library. This workshop will introduce you to the beginning stages of the research process, focusing on initial information gathering through electronic books. It will provide you with techniques to become more effective at searching for background information on a chosen topic. Now, we do have a number of learning objectives today, and those are located in your workshop outline. If you don't have your workshop outline in front of you, that's certainly okay. Let me show you where you can access all of the workshop recordings, outlines, as well as transcripts. You're going to go to the Research Help drop-down menu and click on Learn the Library. From there, you can click on the Library Workshop Videos screen or link. This is going to provide you with all of the recorded library workshops. Additionally, on the left-hand side, you will see the outlines and the transcripts as well if you need to follow along with the written transcript. So again, you can return here if you need to take a look at a later date at the outline for beginning the research process. Okay, so going back to those learning objectives, upon completion of this workshop, you will know how to access the research process guide on the library's website, understand the basic criteria for evaluating information, identify the differences between primary and secondary sources, as well as the differences between academic and popular sources, select the appropriate database for beginning research needs, and finally, use ebook databases to obtain background knowledge on a topic. So, we're going to jump right into this by going to the Research Help drop down menu and clicking on the Research Process. The Research Process is a thorough overview of the research process, starting with finding a research topic and going down to scholarly publication and everything in between. Today's workshop will correspond to the section titled Determining Information Needs, as that's a huge part of the research process, starting out by identifying what type of information you actually need. And then we'll move on to, again, that initial information gathering stage. Okay, so I'm going to click on Evaluating Information because this is going to apply to you no matter what stage of the research process you're in. If you're in the initial beginning stages like we are today, or if you're further along in your research. Basically, a major part of the research process includes evaluating the sources of information you locate in your searches. And there are various sorts of guidelines or beliefs in terms of how to effectively evaluate information, but it's generally agreed upon that these are the basic components. So right here in the box that says evaluation criteria, this is also located in your workshop outline. So these are things to keep in mind as you go throughout your research process, whether you're finding those background uh, information sources or whether you've moved on to scholarly journal articles, you need to think about these aspects, including the currency of the resource, basically how, how up to date is that research? Is it too old? Has anything changed? Or is it okay that it's not as current? Perhaps it is considered a seminal source. Maybe it's a journal article from 20 years ago that is continually cited to this day and it's made a significant impact on the field. So it's not so cut and dry that something has to be new within the last five years, but currency is definitely something to consider. Authority and credentials, basically who has authored that resource and how qualified are they to have author that particular research. So authority and credentials is important. Accuracy and reliability, is the information or research accurate or valid? Can the same information be verified by other sources? 
The audience is also something important to consider. And we'll talk about this more when we talk about academic versus popular sources. But what is the intended audience for that resource? Is it a child? Is it a doctoral student? Is it a practitioner in the field? This is an important thing to identify. Is it written for a scholarly audience? It doesn't necessarily have to be, although most of your resources probably will be written for a scholarly or academic audience. And finally, does the resource contain bias? Does it spout a particular belief or viewpoint, or is it neutral on a particular topic? Does it have any sort of hidden agenda? And does the point of view reflect the accuracy or reliability of the information? So you can continue reading about evaluating information on this particular page under determining information needs, but I just wanted to quickly cover that evaluation criteria since it's something that should always be in the back of your mind. And I do see a question, so let me take a look at that question. Okay, so the question is, Regarding currency, approximately 85% of resources used in the dissertation have to be within five years of the defense date. Are there certain databases that are updated more frequently than others? Okay, so let's first talk about that 85% rule. Obviously, that's something that you have to keep in mind as you're doing your research for your dissertation. However, do keep in mind that that 15% will allow those older resources, those seminal resources that may have had that significant contribution on the field. In terms of the databases being updated, they are all updated on probably a weekly basis. Now, every individual database is going to have a different sort of schedule in terms of when they upload their new content, but we do have articles in the library's collection that are recent as of this month. So the library overall is very, very up to date. And one thing I can mention on this question, Casey, is that you may want to investigate setting up alerts to get alerted to the newest content related to your particular search or topic. And we do have an entire page on setting up search alerts, which can be found under our Finding Similar Resources guide. So you can go to database alerts and RSS feeds. Great question. Okay, so let's move on to our primary sources. Primary sources contain first-hand information, meaning that you're reading the author's own account of a specific topic or event that they participated in. So those primary sources are going to be very important and you're going to encounter them a lot because journal articles, research journal articles are an example of a primary source. However, I do want to let you know that primary sources often do not explain terminology and theoretical principles in detail. They assume a certain level of familiarity and knowledge with that particular topic. So in other words, if you're reading scholarly journal articles on educational leadership, they're going to assume that you're part of the larger scholarly audience or a practitioner in the field, and you know the, the general theories of educational leadership. They're not going to explain that. Therefore, it becomes very important to know how to find additional background information before finding some of these primary sources. Primary sources, there are some characteristics listed here. They have uh, usually a single author, scholarly academic language, high page counts, tables, figures or findings, etc. Primary sources can include, let's see, I think we have those listed here as well. Yeah, examples are original documents such as diaries, speeches, manuscripts, letters, etc. 
as well as research articles, like I said before, clinical reports, case studies, dissertations, and also creative works, which are not necessarily thought of when you think of primary sources, but poetry, music, video, photography, because those artists or those writers were the originator of that content. So here's an example of a primary source. Here's a photograph of our 18th president, Ulysses S. Grant. So photographs are primary sources. Another example of a primary source, like I said earlier, which is the one you're going to encounter probably most often, are those scholarly journal articles. So when you're considering a scholarly journal article, you want to make sure that those authors did actually conduct their own particular study and are not just summarizing other studies that have been done. And one way that you can do that is to check to see if they have some sort of section on methodology. So here's their section on method, and it's saying that they did a, a random survey, online survey of NCAA Division I athletic departments. So they conducted their own original research, just like this photographer took his own original photograph. That makes a primary source. Okay, so secondary sources, in contrast to that, do not present original research or works from that author. Rather, they describe, summarize, or discuss information or details originally presented in another source. So meaning the author did not participate in that event or in that observation. Secondary sources are typically written for a broad audience, and these will include definitions of specific terms, history relating to the topic, significant theories, principles, and summaries of major events within the field. So unlike those primary sources. So you can use secondary sources to obtain an overview of a topic and or identify more specific primary resources. One of the most familiar secondary sources for you will probably be your college textbooks. But I do have some additional examples of secondary sources here. So here is a entry from the Chambers Biographical Dictionary on Ulysses S. Grant. So this provides a brief summary of his life. It looks like Roger and, and Bakewell have edited this particular publication. They did not participate in his life, right? They're just summarizing information from various sources and bringing it into this succinct entry. Other examples would include encyclopedia articles, almanacs, handbooks, etc. Another example of a secondary source is a review article. So a review paper could appear in a scholarly journal. However, review articles do not conduct original research. So in this case, they are focusing on transformational leadership and employee psychological well-being, but they're reviewing other researchers that have contributed to this. And they're summarizing their research in the review paper. So you may enc certainly encounter these review papers in your research, and you have to be able to determine if that original research was done or if they are just summarizing other research. And it's very easy to tell by going to something like a methodology section and examining whether they conducted their own, their own original research. So other examples of secondary sources include popular journal and magazine articles, book reviews, commentaries, and criticism. Okay, so let's move on to the academic and popular resources. Most of the time, those 
primary sources are going to be academic in nature, although not necessarily so. Academic resources are those that are authored by experts for experts. Basically, they disseminate research and promote academic discussion among those professionals in the field. Academic sources undergo a re formal review process and typically report original research, research methodology, or theory. So there are various types of academic sources. They could include books, dissertations, and for the most part, scholarly journals. And those scholarly journals oftentimes will be peer reviewed. So you may hear that in your assignment requirements or like we talked about earlier, your dissertation requirements, that a majority of the resources should be peer reviewed. So mo many scholarly journals use the peer review process where an external panel of peers, well, re peer reviewers will look at that article that's submitted to the journal and evaluate it and hold it to a very high standard before publication. But not all scholarly journals use the peer review process. Additionally, publishers of academic sources are typically professional associations or academic presses. So most of your research resources for your coursework should be academic in nature. We do have characteristics listed here. There's quite a number of characteristics such as an extensive reference list, so you know that the, the source is well documented. They may have used a research methodology, like qualitative, quantitative, or, or mixed methods re research. There may be a sample, like we saw in our previous journal article example, a sample gathered from a population. In this case, they conducted a survey use of measurement instruments to gather data, literature reviews, inferences made from findings, etc. So in contrast to those academic sources are the popular sources. And popular sources, you can probably figure out what they are in contrast to those academic sources, these do not go through the same rigorous review process as academic resources. In many cases, there's a single editor who may or may not have expertise in a subject area before publishing a resource. Basically, they're there to inform and entertain, written for a broad audience and do not always use the same formal language as those of academic sources. So some examples of popular sources include magazine and newspaper articles, websites, and wikis. And then we have some characteristics that are different than that for academic sources, such as shorter sentences, more simple language. There's author reports information from interviews or secondhand sources. Sometimes the author is not listed or qualifications are not indicated. A bibliography or references is usually not included. And there could be very colorful photographs to appeal to that wider audience versus the academic audience. So one type, like we said, one type of popular sources could be wikis, such as Wikipedia. And I did want to talk to you, and this is in your outline as well, that Wikipedia and similar online encyclopedias may be comprehensive, but you're not going to want to cite them in your academic research. So it's certainly okay to consult them, read them, get background information, use them to find additional sources, but not to cite them in your research. One thing that's not listed on this page, but I did want to touch on very briefly, is the scope of a resource. So we talked about the different types of resources, but we also need to consider the scope of a resource when we're going into that initial information gathering stage. 
The scope of a resource refers to how comprehensive it is. How thorough is the resource in covering the subject area? Typically, newspaper, magazine, and journal articles are less comprehensive than books covering the same topic. When gathering background information, it may serve you well to consult books since they will provide more information on your topic, which is why we're going to focus on those books right now. Okay, so let's move into our ebook databases. If you do think of any questions, don't hesitate to put those into the chat area. The, the library subscribes to several ebook databases. And again, these ebooks may be a good source of background information on your topic, including definitions, histories, key terms, key researchers, key theories in the field, etc. So what I'm going to do is go to the Research Resources drop-down menu and click on Find an eBook. So this page contains 12 databases which do provide eBooks, and most of them are subscription. There are a couple included here that are for open access resources. What we're going to start out with today is the Credo Reference Database. This provides access to a large number of encyclopedias, dictionaries, the SORI, and additional reference books. On the Credo Reference homepage, there's a large central search box that we can use to put in our topic information. You can also go up to the top of the screen and browse the books or the topic pages. The mind map is something that you could possibly use when you're trying to find a research topic. And if you're at that stage, we do have an entire workshop on finding a research topic, which I highly recommend. But let's go ahead and click on books just so you can see how this is organized. We do have 839 reference books here within Credo Reference. And on the left-hand side of the screen, you can narrow down those books by topic area. You can also search within the books. But probably more often than not, you're just going to want to search Credo for whatever your topic is. In this case, we are going to search for job satisfaction. Okay, so now we're on our results screen, and we do have a number of search results here, but what I wanna do is click on the first search result here because this icon right here indicates that it is a topic page. And I do see, we do have a question here. Oh, okay, so I missed a question earlier, which was a workshop on research methodology. We do not have, you know what, we actually have a workshop on using SAGE research methods. So that would be the library resource corresponding to research methodology. We also have a workshop on finding tests and measurements. But we don't provide a workshop on how to do research method, how to conduct research that would be outside of the domain of the library, but good question. So I recommend in that case, the workshop on SAGE research methods, and then the workshop on finding tests and measurements. Okay, so moving on to Jeffrey's question, could you do a search for diversity? I can certainly do that. So here is the topic page for job satisfaction there would probably be a topic page on diversity, so let's give that a try right now. Perfect, so here we have the topic page on diversity. What the topic page does is provides a brief overview, similar to something that you might read in Wikipedia. However, this is a reliable source that you can safely cite in your academic research. So as long as you're not required to have a peer-reviewed ar article because obviously this is coming from a reference book. In this case, it's coming from key concepts in public relations. Here on the topic page, we can continue reading to read the entire overview. 
Some are shorter than others. This one's a little bit more brief, but it does provide you with additional related topics, images, etc. I'm going to go back to our, it is cool, isn't it, Jeffrey? I'm glad you think so. Um, so like, that's, that's a great example that you brought us of a starting point for diversity, because if you tried to do a, an article search for diversity, there would be millions and millions of articles focusing on different aspects. Whereas in this case, we just want to get that broad overview so we can maybe even narrow down our topic a little bit better, but more importantly, get that initial understanding. There's also a topic page here on cultural diversity. And then we start looking at our individual results. So here, if I wanted to focus on diversity, this one's coming from the Encyclopedia of Human Rights in the United States. We could click on that one. Sometimes what I'll do is sort of look at the um, number of words in the entry. So this one has 801 words versus this one, which is 195 words, which is very short. And you can see in this case that some of them focus on biological diversity, which may not be what we actually had in mind. So you can always narrow it by subject on the left-hand side of the screen. And I sometimes like to narrow it by length, meaning I don't wanna look at the short ones because those are often just dictionary definitions of the term. You also have date limiters, and then you can determine if it has a, an image included. Credo reference is a great starting point for that initial background information. I'm going to close out of, you're welcome, Jeffrey. I'm going to close out of Credo reference, and the next one we're going to go to is eBook Central. eBook Central was previously called eBrary. So if you are already a library user and you were familiar with eBrary, this is the same content. It's just, it's just got an upgrade. So it had a little bit of a makeover. So eBook Central, or previously eBrary, contains over 200,000 eBooks. So this is our largest eBook database. And it does contain all academic books, and those could be reference as well as non-reference books. So what we're going to do is we can stick with our topic of the day, which is diversity. I'm just going to type that in. And we have over 96,000 results for diversity, which could be a little bit overwhelming. So we may want to add additional search terms or use the limiters on the left-hand side of the screen to refine our search. But if we see a book that we're interested in, we can go ahead and click on it. So I'm going to do that at this time. And it's first going to bring you to a landing page, which provides you, and actually, let me make this a little bit bigger for you. Hopefully that looks a little bit better. It looks a little bit better for me. This will contain all of the bibliographic information or the publishing information on the right-hand side of the screen. In the center of the screen, it's going to tell you how many pages are available for copying or printing and if it's available for a full download. So this is informative in the center of the screen. However, I do want to let you know that it is not necessary for you to do a full download because at any point you can read the entire book online okay the full download just allows you to save it to whatever device that you would like to save it to for a period of 21 days using an ebook reader so let's go ahead and just read online this is a brief book. This one is only 33 pages, but obviously there are a lot more comprehensive books here in eBook Central. But we can use the arrows in the upper right to flip page by page. Actually, this is probably a nice overview of managing diversity. And we can also search within the publication on the left-hand side or navigate the table of contents to go to a specific area in that book. My favorite 
feature of eBook Central is the ability to add this resource to your own personal bookshelf. And the way that you do that is with this book icon with the little plus sign. So it says that it's been added to my bookshelf and notice that I did not have to log in to do that. Basically, as a user of North Central University, you are assigned a basically a unique identifier when you enter into eBrary or eBook Central, sorry. So when you enter into eBook Central from the library, you are automatically logged in. Okay, so if you are a previous user of eBrary, once you get to this screen, you have a message that you can migrate your old eBrary bookshelf to the new eBook Central. So if any of you are in that situation, that's quick and simple to do. We do have an FAQ on that, but certainly contact the library if you have any questions. So let's look for that book that I just added to my bookshelf. If I wanted to, I could add it to a particular folder that I have created on the left-hand side of the screen. So let's see, you used to be able to drag and drop. I'm not sure if you can do that anymore. Let's see here. Copy to, yeah. So copy to, if I wanted to add it to my leadership folder, I could add the item there. Otherwise, when you're just on this main screen that says the research, all of your uncategorized books will appear there. And then on the left-hand side, if you wanted to go to another particular folder, then it will display that folder title at the top. So this is my favorite feature because if you have books that you've identified that you wanna use again and again in eBook Central, it's quick and simple just to come in and go to your bookshelf and then look at those books. So these books could be very, very in depth. With the eBooks, keep in mind that they're not going to be as up to date as journal articles. So journal articles are getting updated daily within the library's databases, whereas books, they might be published, you know, editions might come out every five years or so. So currency when it comes to books is a little bit different than when it comes to journal articles where you want the latest research. Okay, the next ebook database that I'm going to go into is called PsychBooks. And I like to point this one out, particularly for those students that are interested in psychology or marriage and family sciences. However, there is a lot of overlap with psychology and other disciplines like education and business. So it's Something to keep in mind, even if you're in a different school within NCU. PsychBooks does not have as large of a collection as some of the other ebook databases, but they are going to provide a wealth of information on that topic. So let's go ahead and see. I'm I'm actually curious to see if there is anything on diversity in psych books. So let's go ahead and just do a keyword search here for diversity. These are going to include reference books as well as non-reference books. Not all of them are going to be in full text. So if you want to make sure that the books are in full text, you want to put on the full text limiter on the left hand side of the screen. If Within PsychBooks or any other library database, you're unable to access the full text ebook. Keep in mind that you can always place an interlibrary loan request for a book chapter only. So you cannot request the entire book via interlibrary loan, but you can identify a particular chapter that you're most interested in and place a request for that chapter. And that is simply, that limitation is simply based on US copyright law. Okay, so here are our set of results, 442. PsychBooks does things a little bit differently because they break the results down into the individual chapters. So let's say that we were interested in 
promoting diversity and inclusiveness. Let's go ahead and click on this one. Okay, so this is a chapter coming from the APA Handbook of Clinical Psychology, Psychopathology, and Health. So if we wanted to access the full text, we could click on that PDF. So unlike Credo Reference that we saw before and unlike the eBook Central database, PsychBooks puts their book chapters as, as PDF documents. So here we could save our book chapter or we could print it or just read it here online. The next ebook database I want to go into is called Psychiatry Online. And Psychiatry Online is important if you are a psychology or marriage and family science student, especially because this is the only place to access the DSM-5 library, so the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders. This is the only place to access it, so that's why I like to point it out. Additionally, it has a number of other books and journals, full-text journals. Okay, so here we enter right into the latest edition of the DSM, if you're interested in that. Additionally, there are some other books listed here, and they're adding to this. The newest one is the American Psychiatric Association Publishing Textbook of Psychopharmacology. So if we were interested in that, we could go into that full text. We'll give that a moment to load. All of the chapters or parts are hyperlinked, so if I wanted to look at the drugs for treatment of bipolar disorder, I could go ahead and click on that, and then I would be able to access that full text chapter. Okay, so there we go. Unfortunately, there are no PDFs available for these book chapters. So basically, you're just going to be reading that content online. Okay, I quickly wanted to point that out. And then our last ebook database that I want to cover today, and you can go into the others on your own time, I want to go into the Sage Knowledge Database. Sage Knowledge is somewhat similar to Credo Reference in that it contains only reference book material, dictionaries, encyclopedias, handbooks, etc. We also have some video content in here as well, as well as major works and major and debates. And major works are basically summaries of of that particular topic, and then it identifies seminal works in the field. So let's go ahead and stick with our topic of diversity. We'll be very broad here tonight. Okay, so we have over 39,000 results for diversity. And if we wanted to narrow this down, we could use the limiters on the right-hand side. So right now we're searching all types of books, including reference books and videos. Okay, Jeffrey has a question. Just to clarify, are Sage works, let me actually read it. Are Sage works considered peer reviewed? That's a great question. We are currently in the Sage knowledge database, which contains only books and videos, as well as those debates that we saw. So these are not peer reviewed resources. They would be considered academic works for sure, but they are not peer reviewed. However, Sage does have a journal article database and that you can get to within our A to Z databases. You can go to the S and the Sage journals database provides access to hundreds of scholarly journals which are in fact peer reviewed. So when we're talking about books, very few books are ever peer reviewed. There may be some publishers that use a peer review process, but for the most part, books are not peer reviewed. So 
these sage knowledge sources would not be considered peer reviewed, but they would be an authoritative source for background information, such as this entry on diversity in the sage encyclopedia of marriage, family and couples counseling. We were to click on that, we would go directly into that full text content. Sage is also good in providing a number of references within each chapter or entry. So there you can see all of those further readings on the bottom of the screen. And if anything catches your eye there, that's something you can always search for in the NCU library to see if we provide that full text content. So as you can see, Sage Knowledge is going to be a great source of background information on your particular topic as well. So we've utilized a number of ebook databases, Credo Reference, eBook Central, Psychbooks, Psychiatry Online, and now Sage Knowledge to do that initial information gathering for our particular topic. Once we have learned about the definitions, concepts, theories, histories, prominent researchers, etc., then we're ready to move on to conduct that scholarly research. And I do recommend our Searching 101 and our Searching 102 workshops to really get a handle on how to effectively search Roadrunner to find those scholarly journal articles. Roadrunner is your best starting point because it does search most of our library's databases simultaneously. So it's the closest thing you have here to a Google search. It will pull results from scholarly journals, magazines, newspapers, videos, etc. Or we can apply the scholarly and peer-reviewed journal limiter only, and then we will ensure that all of our results are coming from scholarly journals, which may or may not be peer reviewed. So let's go to our advanced search since we have a couple more minutes. And we'll just do an initial search for our research topic. And let's say it's diversity in the workplace. So we'll do diversity and workplace. And I'll apply that scholarly and peer reviewed journal limiter. We're going to be super broad, but let's go ahead and, and conduct our search. So these are the results that you will be able to comprehend a little bit better once you've already done that background search for your topic. There are a couple of things that I want to point out in terms of the Roadrunner search results, and again, we go into this in depth in Searching 101 and Searching 102, but I do want to point out that a lot of the results will have the full text PDF attached, but if they don't, you may start to see some of those link resolvers. So here we can click full text from Science Direct to link out to that full text content within the Science Direct database. So that took us directly to that full text. And let me look at another one. Here is a different example. This one is called the 360 link to full text. So let's give that one a try. This is actually what I did want to point out to you is that if the full text is unavailable, you'll land here at this particular page. And in this case, uh, this article is coming from the journal Nature. And I know that we don't actually subscribe to that particular journal. So what you can do at this point is place your interlibrary loan request. And we do have a full length workshop on interlibrary loan as well, which you can access on the Learn the Library page for the library workshop videos. And then to access the interlibrary loan guide, you can come to our services drop down menu and click on interlibrary loan. So this was just a quick launching point into your research for scholarly journal articles, as we talked about before, which will probably form the bulk of your research. And this is what you'll come to once you have done that initial background 
research on your topic. Located in your workshop outline are a couple of additional links to resources, including our research process page for finding a research topic. So some of you may have come to this workshop you know, wanting to know how to get started, but not necessarily having a research topic. And maybe you are going to be writing a dissertation. This is a good place to explore that content and learn about what's the best way to go about finding a research topic. Also a reminder, the Learn the Library page has all of our workshop recordings, our quick tutorial videos, etc. If you view a workshop recording, you can always provide us with feedback about that recording by using the Library Workshop Feedback Survey. And those of you that are attending live today, you will receive an email shortly that will ask you to take that survey as well. Finally, we have a link in your outline to organizing research and citations. So this will go over everything from how to use RefWorks to how to create database alerts and RSS feeds to get alerted to the newest content related to your particular search or topic. All right, well, I hope that this workshop has been helpful. And if you have any questions, certainly feel free to put those into the chat, or you can certainly unmute yourself and ask over a microphone. I'm happy to stick around as long as you guys have questions. If you don't have any questions, certainly feel free to take off, and I hope to see you in future workshops.